Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Rothenberg. I'm a co-director of the Center on the Future of War. We're thrilled uh, today to have our speaker for our final event in the fall speaker series, um, Joe Brasta, who's going to be speaking about the future of the JCPOA and the Iranian nuclear program, uh, a very hot issue at the moment in a variety of ways. And Joe was also featured this morning on uh, uh, with an interview with Steve Goldstein at KJAZ, our NPR affiliate for those who are not based here in Phoenix who are attending our session. Um, very briefly, our, 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 our system today is going to be, uh, Joe's going to present, he's got a number of slides and a PowerPoint. At the end of his presentation, we'll open for questions. And we ask all of you to enter your questions into the chat box in Zoom, and then I'll be able to play the role of moderator by presenting those questions to Joe. And um, you know, we're thrilled that you're joining us tonight. So Joe Brasta is an affiliate expert on non-proliferation at CRDF Global, which is headquartered in Washington, DC. He spent many years researching and writing and lecturing on topics such as Iran, um, uh, nuclear weapons, delivery systems. He's spoken at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies and worked at the Center for Global Security Research at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory um, and also at the IAEA in Vienna, the, the main international body that deals with um, uh, in investigating and dealing with non-proliferation issues. Uh, his career is very interesting career. Um, you'll notice from his video, you can see that he is surrounded by guitarists. He's a, 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 a former professional musician. Um, we we're just chatting about that. But interestingly, he went to undergraduate at ASU, so he's a Sun Devil, uh, when he was in his 40s and had a career change. He had previously been working as an executive in the hospitality industry where his job was to work in four and five star luxury hotels, identify operational issues. And then he had a transition to uh, an undergraduate degree in political science at ASU and then a master's degree in the Middlebury Institute uh, for International Studies. And he moved in the direction of dealing with non-proliferation issues. And I, I'm mentioning that one, because that's part of Joe's life, but also because it's relevant for our program at the Center on the Future of War in the School of Politics and Global Studies, because we run an online MA in global security, and many of our students, our average age of the students are in their 30s, and many of them are folks who are involved in a variety of career transitions, often from the military to private sector, and in a variety of other ways. And you know, we embrace the idea that education and life transformation is an ongoing process, and that engaging in security studies and security issues is not something that has a unitary path. So we're particularly excited that Joe's with us today, who's like, you know, living embodiment of that vision. So um, Joe, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm gonna disappear and take myself off the video. The floor is all yours and I'll reappear as moderator when you're done with your uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thanks so much. Wonderful, thank you, Daniel. And uh, I wanna thank everybody that's attending today. This is obviously a, a hot topic. Um, it's uh, taking center stage, uh, you know, in global politics right now for good reason. This has been uh, uh, an issue that has been widely reported uh, through misinformation. Um, and because of that, I'm going to spend a, a significant portion of this talk on describing to you the provisions of the deal and how they relate to the Iranian nuclear facilities and program. And then we'll move into what's happening today and what are some of the potential outcomes. So let's get started. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was revealed uh, at a Board of Governors meeting at the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, in 2013. I happen to be present at that meeting. And one of the things I like to tell people is when it was Joint Plan of Action before it had been negotiated to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the people in, in my community looked at the provisions of this deal and, and we didn't think Iran was going to agree to almost any of it. It was so intrusive. Um, but lo and behold, 21 months later, Iran agreed to almost all of the provisions. And the reason this is, is, uh, was, was such a surprise is that Iran agreed to many uh, inspection uh, mechanisms that no other country has ever agreed to. Um, and so let, let's take a look at that because I think it's, it's very important. But first, let's talk about the U.S. team. So early on in, in this administration, there was a lot of language being thrown around that we should be negotiating these agreements with business leaders as opposed to hacks 
or some of the other names that were used to describe Ernie Moniz and Wendy Sherman. Now, these were the chief negotiators on John Kerry's team. And so I've been talking about the JCPOA uh, ever since I've learned about it being at the JPOA in, in Vienna. And I immediately did my homework on, on this team and, it, and you could not come up with a more qualified group of people led by these two individuals to negotiate this time of an agreement. So Ernie Moniz was Department of Energy Secretary. Um, he has a PhD in theoretical physics from Stanford and he was the head of the Department of Physics at MIT. He's also the director of the Bates Linear Accelerator. So the man is a brilliant nuclear physicist with, with decades of experience. And as the Secretary of Energy, he had all of the national laboratories at his disposal. So that's a lot of brilliant minds to back him up when it came down to the technical components of this negotiation. Then along with him, we had a, a brilliant states person in Wendy Sherman. She was a US Deputy Secretary of State. Um, she's got her MA from the University of Maryland. But here, here's the thing that I find the most interesting about Wendy Sherman and, and the comments that were made early on on the negotiating team. Wendy Sherman was the CEO and president of Fannie Mae Foundation. If you're unfamiliar with Fannie Mae, they're the largest mortgage holder in the world. So when people were making comments that we should use business leaders, well, we have us, uh, somebody who's an experienced diplomat and experienced negotiator who also happens to be a very experienced business person. So there's a reason why you want to put together a team like this when you're negotiating with the Iranians on their nuclear program. And that is because look who's on their side. So Salahi was the head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. He also has a PhD in nuclear engineering. But here's the interesting thing about this guy. He was the chancellor of Sharif University for Technology. Let's, let's back up several years. Iran knew, Iran's files referred to the United Nations Security Council for being in violation of its safeguard agreement because we discovered, the world discovered, that Iran had clandestine facilities that they had not declared to the IAEA. Okay, so they built Natanz and Iraq and Fordo facilities, which I'll talk about in a minute, almost entirely by producing materials and technology indigenously, but by also opening up illicit procurement channels. So the reason I point this out on Salahi and the chance or the Sharif University is that there is a place in within this university called the Physics Research Center. It was just a big empty room, but it's how Salahi was able to procure materials they couldn't indigenously produce by forging documentation and, and obscuring end user agreements and, and things of that nature. So this guy Salahi, not only is he a brilliant nuclear physicist, but he also masterminded the procurement of enough materials they could be build three technically advanced nuclear facilities. Sitting on the table with, with Salahi is Mohammed Zarif. He, this is a brilliant attorney. He's got two master's degrees in international relations. He's got a PhD in international law. He's an Iranian ambassador to the United Nations, meaning this man is a, is a master at state, statecraft and diplomacy. So this is why you need to assemble the team that was assembled to, to negotiate this agreement because a business a person with only a business background would have gotten buried by these guys. They're very good at what they do. They're highly competent and, and they have the technical background in order to advance their objectives. So let's look at the deal. What are some of the key provisions of the deal? The, the Iranians agreed to limit low enriched uranium production to 300 kilograms at 3.67% for 15 years. So what that means is that that, that is a, not a significant amount of uranium. And at low enrichment, if you spun this in your centrifuges further and tried to enrich it higher than 3.6%, you would wind up spinning all of your uh, uranium out and would not have enough left for weapons. So that was, uh, that was a, a big shift in direction for the Iranians. They were already stockpiling. They, were, they agreed to reduce their inventory of 19,000 centrifuges to 5,060 for 10 years and limiting them to IR1s. So what this means is that these IR1s are, are old archaic machines. They break down a lot. They do not have a, a good efficiency record. 
Um, basically, 5060 IR-1s are not going to be able to spin enough weapons-grade uranium uh, for the Iranians to advance a nuclear weapon program. Um, the, these machines were, were procured from Pakistan in the 80s, so they're very outdated. And as I mentioned, they don't have a good efficiency record. There is something called a separative work unit. This is a, a method by which they apply the efficiency of these machines. Th these things have a, a 1.03 annual uh, separation work unit. It's called a SWU. Uh, advanced machines these days have a, a, you know, a 95 SWU. So these are just old and they break down and they are not reliable. So when they reduce their stockpile of centrifuges from 19,000 to 5,060, the, the excess machines will be stored under continuous IAEA monitoring for 20 years and they'll be disassembled, okay? What you're looking at in this picture of Natanz and, and these advanced centrifuges, you're looking at the casing. Within this casing, there is something called a bellows and a rotor. What you should understand about how centrifuge technology works, these bellows and rotors are attached and they spin extremely fast. Now these machines, their, their uh, bellows and rotors only spin about 1000 rotations per second. So that's old, that doesn't really work that efficiently. Okay, but that the interior of these machines are disassembled and those parts are laid out so that the IAEA can monitor them 24 seven with cameras for 20 years. Now, additionally, if you look at this picture of Natanz, you see all this piping and electrical work, all of that has to be removed. And what that means is that if the Iranians decided they wanted to rebuild this facility beyond the parameters of the deal, it would take a, a large effort. It would require a lot of engineers and we would see it, we would know. So the uh, Iranians also agreed to limit their research and development on the advanced machines while the IAE is monitoring the work that they're doing. We know, and that's why I placed this picture in the upper right, that the Iranians have made great strides at advancing the research and development of their centrifuge program. There are, they, um, they have IR2Ms, which are twice as uh, fast as IR1s. They have IR4s, sixes, eights, and now they have just come up with an IR9. So limiting their research and development will significantly slow their ability to put these into cascades and start separating uranium. Now, this final bullet point on this particular slide is what's, what's one of the things that I find really remarkable. Now, all of these, these provisions that they've agreed to are intrusive and nobody else has agreed to allow the IAEA uh, this kind of an inspection regime. But this final one is what's inter interesting because it's a centrifuge component man manufacturing transparency. The IAEA can inspect their uh, manufacturing facilities for centrifuges. Now that is outside of the IAEA's domain. They are uh, mandated to uh, inspect and verify facilities that utilize nuclear material, fissile material. This, this is not what these facilities are. These are manufacturing facilities. There is no uh, design material being introduced at this stage. So it was really kind of the IAEA acting outside of their domain, but they want to make sure that the Iranians aren't producing a bunch of centrifuges that they're stockpiling somewhere so they can start building another clandestine facility like they do with Natanz and Fordo. So all of these, these provisions here are, are, are connecting the dots and building a puzzle to prevent the Iranian students from acting in a way that the international community wouldn't be able to recognize right away as illicit or a diversion or moving towards a weapons program. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the IAE right now. Here are some of the provisions related to, to that organization. First of all, that they, they need to clarify possible military dimensions. Now they did this, uh, what they really wanted to see was an, a military installation called Park Chin. So they were allowed to inspect that. We don't really know how they inspected it because IAEA and Iran have a, a classified agreement on how that was conducted. But the director general at the time, Yukia Amano, made a statement that said, we have uh, 
we have examined this facility where we wanted to examine it and we have taken environmental samples and, and found no fissile material. So they were able to close the, the file on any possible past military dimension. Now, let me just caveat that by saying that the, the consensus is that Iran was working on nuclear weapons design work at this facility. They had a high explosive chamber that is necessary when you are uh, designing an implosion device. So without getting too technical, an implosion device is a type of nuclear weapon where a plutonium pit is wrapped in high explosives that are timed to go off simultaneously with the same amount of pressure. This, this implodes on this pit and causes fission. So that's what we suspect they were doing. We do not suspect that they have been uh, continuing this work after 2009. Now, the next two bullet points are, are, are remarkable in that Iran has agreed to ratify something called the Additional Protocol. I'll be brief. The Additional Protocol is an additional protocol to a comprehensive safeguards agreement. When a member state joins the IAEA, they they negotiate a, a safeguards agreement that sets up the IAEA's inspection regime. They must declare all of their facilities and the IAEA will then uh, work with that state to determine how and when they will inspect. The additional protocol came out of the first Gulf War uh, when the IAEA went in and inspected a facility uh, that uh, Saddam Hussein had declared. Um, and then they entered a building on that same property that was near it and found Saddam Hussein had a clandestine nuclear weapon program. So the, they came up with this thing called an additional protocol. And the main thing you should know about that is a regular safeguards agreement. You declare your facilities and the IAEA sets up an inspection regime. Additional protocol allows the IAEA to say, hey, we want to see this other facility now that's not declared and the state must comply if they've got an additional protocol. So that's an important addition. It really strengthens the IAEA's ability to investigate. But here, this next one, uh, this modified code 3.1 subsidiary arrangement, this was kind of what everything hinged on back in the mid 2000s when the Iranians were referred to the Security Council. And I'm gonna tell you about this because of importance. See, the Iranians didn't believe that their facilities that they were building clandestinely were illegal. The modified code 3.1 is a code that the IAEA uh, came up with and passed through the Board of Governors and imposed it on all of its member states. And what it changed was this. This code says, prior to this code, the IAEA said, you must declare any new facilities uh, 180 days before you introduce fuel, okay? This is what the Iranians agreed to in the beginning. And when they modified the code and changed it to you must declare any new facilities during the design phase, the Iranians said, we didn't agree to that. And that's where the whole disagreement came in and the Iranians were you know, sent to the Security Council and, and, and international sanctions were applied. So now Iran, which allowed 10 years worth of sanctions to be levied on it over a disagreement on this code has now agreed to confirm the code. So this is a major concession for them. So there's a comprehensive inspection regime. And here, the next one is, uh, this next bullet point is interesting in that now there is something called a procurement channel. All of the uh, materials going through uh, international trade that might lend technology or materials to Iran's nuclear program has to be monitored. And there is a working group that's set up to do that. Then there's a dispute mechanism with the time limit. We'll talk about that again in a minute, that's huge. Um, and then here's one, what a lot of people don't understand, that the long-term enrichment plan uh, for Iran, for its facilities, is coordinated with the IAEA. And it, so Iran will not be allowed to just start spinning centrifuges and stockpiling uranium. That doesn't make any sense for the facilities that they have. It's all going to be coordinated with experts who are going to uh, uh, place limits. So let's go to some facilities now. So... This is Iraq. This is a heavy water research reactor. This was discovered by a rebel group and, and leaked to the West. The Iranians had pretty much built this thing. I, uh, it was mostly completed when we discovered it. Um, this is basically a plutonium production facility. Okay, so you get plutonium is, is a material you can make a nuclear weapon with. And it's a man-made 
product. It's a fissile material that's, that is the result of, of reprocessing wasted fuel or spent fuel, I should say. So you reprocess this full fuel and you pull plutonium. Well, the fuel that's that the waste fuel for this type of reactor is perfect for that. So this is why it was so alarming when we discovered they had this and they had not declared it to the IAEA. So now they were redesigning it so it can only produce maybe one kilogram of plutonium a year, but it has to be reprocessed. Understand that as far as we know, the Iranians do not have any reprocessing facilities. Um, all of the spent fuel has to be shipped out of the country. We now know that that's going to Russia and they will build no new heavy water reactors and they will not accumulate heavy water so that if they have a clandestine reactor that they're building someplace else, they will not have the heavy, heavy water for it. And, uh, and no research in developing on uh, any type of reprocessing technologies for 15 years. So add to that the IA inspecting on the entire fuel cycle, including mining, which is important, no other state allows the IAEA to inspect their mining, but we wanted to make sure that the Iranians weren't pulling uranium out of the ground and shipping it to a clandestine facility for enrichment. So it, it, it basically uh, nullifies this as a, a weapons production uh, facility. But here's something I, I like to include in this particular part of this talk is this is what the Iranians did. They, they removed the calandria. This is the heart of the reactor. Those tubes contain moderator, moderating fluid, the heavy water, it contains the fuel. And um, they, they pulled this thing out and they filled it with cement and redesigned a new calandria and reinserted it. So the thing that you should know about what this means to the Iranians is this research reactor is for peaceful uses. And Iranian scientists are very good at what they do. And this could have been used in medical applications and industrial and agricultural applications. This was a huge point of pride for the Iranian people that they could build a research reactor from scratch um, to better their, their, uh, uh, you know, their abilities. So to pull this out was a major concession. So this will, like I said, this will limit to one kilogram of plutonium a year. You need about nine. So it would take nine years to get reprocess enough plutonium out of this. Um, but there is, Salahi did make a statement that there were new rods ready to reinstall should the deal fall apart. And this is all part of what happened when the Trump administration decided to violate the deal. So let's talk about Fordo briefly. This is an underground nuclear weapons production facility. To the Iranians, it was an enrichment hall. But to the rest of the world, this, this was clandestine. Um, all of the materials were illicitly procured. And this could not be, you couldn't bomb this thing out of existence. You could collapse the tunnels, but it's so buried underneath this mountain that even a nuclear detonation would not uh, destroy the facility. So the Iranians were uh, enriching uranium underground with nobody watching what they were doing, they could have stockpiled an enormous amount of weapons grade material uh, using this facility. But here's what they agreed to. They will not be enriching uranium at this facility anymore. They, they are going to convert this to a stable isotope production facility, meaning things that can be used for industrial medical applications. And they are limited to how many centrifuges that they can have in there. I'm going to talk about the violations in a moment. Right now, I just want to focus on what did they agree to. Excuse me. So I mentioned that there is a working group and a dispute resolution mechanism uh, with a time limit. So the Joint Commission is in charge of monitoring working groups that do uh, different things. Uh, one is that procurement channel that I've discussed before. The Joint Commission monitors that through a working group to make sure the Iranians aren't getting anything that they shouldn't be getting their hands on. And uh, there's a 24-day time limit on access to disputes. Now, this is what's really important about this particular provision, is in the past, there were no time limit on, on disputes for violations of safeguards agreements. And I want to give you an example of, of how that worked with the Iranians. The Iranians had a facility in northern Te Tehran that the IAEA wanted to expect, inspect. It was called Lavistan. And the IAEA said, you know, we want to see this place. And the Iranians said, okay, yeah, but we need six, we need three months. And three months later, the agency went back to them and they said, well, we're going to need six more months. By the time the uh, IAEA was able to inspect this site, it had already been completely destroyed, scraped, uh, asphalted over. They received no 
usable environmental samples because there's no uh, timing or time limit on these, uh, these resolution mechanisms. But for this, there's a 24 day time limit on this. All right, so without going into a great amount of detail, if the Joint Commission and the partners of the deal believe the Iranians um, are, are diverting or have uh, violated their uh, obligations under the deal, there's a 24 day time limit that will eventually go to the, the Security Council. And if the Security Council has, the Security Council has to pass a resolution that says the Iranians are in compliance. Well, any veto kills that resolution. So this would be a way for the US and the Western partners of the deal to snap that resolution of sanctions because that, that was the threat. That's what the Iranians face if they violate the deal. There's a way to snap back all international sanctions, uh, EU sanctions, UN sanctions, and US sanctions if the Iranians are being found to be out of compliance. And with this time limit, they can't hide what they're doing. That's why it's so important. So why did Iran agree to this? Why would the Iranians roll over like this and, and agree to this you know, brutal inspection regime? Well, they were kicked out of the international banking system. They couldn't, they couldn't trade with any of their trading partners who were willing to, to go around US sanctions. They weren't in SWIFT is what it's called. So th they, we believe that you know, China, who was a big consumer of Iranian oil, was, was sending over cargo ships full of materials and goods in trade for large uh, you know, shipments of oil. So the, with the sanctions relief and access to international banking, the Iranians would be, able to, a lot, would be able to restore its economy, which was what they were starting to do before the US uh, restored its sanctions. So they also were allowed access to restricted funds. There was a, a, a very uh, long period in the news where they, people talked about the Obama administration was giving the Iranians hundreds of millions of dollars and sending a plane with millions of dollars on it of cash to Iran. Well, what that was, was we were lifting restrictions of Iranian funds frozen in international banks. They were just getting access to their own money. So another two important points is that the arms embargo, it expired, this was part of the deal, and that the ballistic missile technology embargo will expire. So they're getting a lot out of it. So then in May, uh, the US announces it will reinstitute unilateral sanctions violating the agreement. So just one point here that this is not a treaty. Treaties have withdrawal provisions. There's a process by which you get out of an agreement that's a treaty. This was an agreement. So what the US did by reinstituting sanctions is the US backed out of its obligation that said it would not do anything to prevent Iran from restoring its economy while both partners of the deal or all partners of the deal were in compliance. So this was a violation by the US part. So what, what, what part of this deal has been working? So China is, is a major benefactor and has benefited greatly from uh, agreements. They are not going to support US sanctions. The partners of the deal realized that this violation of, of this agreement was a political move. There is no, the, the Iranians were in compliance with all the director general reports. They were, the director general of the IAEA was required to put out a report quarterly. And so in the five years of the agreement, it wasn't until last year after we violated, after, excuse me, after the US violated the agreement that the Iranians started violating uh, provisions that they were obligated to keep. So because of that, China is not worked with the U.S. On, on preventing Iran from obtaining things that are, are sanctioned under U.S. law. And China is really going to benefit from that because the, Iran's conventional military is archaic. It's old. They don't, have, they don't have an army. They don't have, well, I mean, they have an army, but what they, they lack is they lack any kind of real military hardware. They don't have an air force. They, they can't buy you know, tires for their jeeps legally. It's just a, a mess which is why they have such a large ballistic missile stockpile, because this is something that they produced with a little bit of help from the North Koreans that can deter aggression. If they've got enough missiles, they can cause a big problem in the Middle East if that's what they decide is in their best interest. So China is, is, is on, 
in, back in January of 2016, China and Iran uh, signed a memorandum of understanding that would ultimately result in $660 billion in trade agreements over the next 10 years. So that's working for China and that's working for Iran. Um, Russia, uh, you see that this anti-aircraft system um, was finally delivered to Iran. Russia uh, stands to gain uh, an enormous uh, customer when it comes to arms sales. Um, Iran would also like to add another reactor at their power uh, reactor at Bushir, and that is a Russian reactor. So that would be uh, a multi-billion dollar operation um, that would go straight to Russia. So Russia is, is, stands to benefit greatly. And additionally, this allows China and Russia a much bigger footprint in, in the Middle East. Uh, negotiating these agreements, you don't just sell a bunch of you know, fourth generation jets to uh, another country and walk away. There has to be maintenance and training and upgrades. So it's a long-term relationship. And IAEA reports Iran was cooperating and it's full compliance. So that was good. We've got eyes onto their program, into their program we've never seen any other state agree to. So we feel very, very comfortable that all of Iran's facilities would be inspected in a way that if they tried to divert uh, materials or technology to a clandestine program, the world would know about it right away. And then we could, we could go back to where we were. So another thing that's, that's working that's very interesting is, is, is that you know, the EU had, had inked a lot of deals with the Iranians. There's a lot of contracts in place when the US violated the agreement. And so they didn't want to support our sanctions. And uh, they, they, it means a lot of money to EU countries. They, they didn't want to walk away from this because our current president wanted to make a, a political point. So they created something called the special purpose vehicle. And what, it really, what that boils down to, it's the mechanism by which the European Union states can trade with Iran and pay them without involving international banking systems that would uh, potentially freeze assets if they were in violation of US sanctions. So for the first time in my knowledge, one of our closest partner organizations created a way to pay one of our adversaries outside of, in, in, within, with, a, with a mechanism that didn't exist prior. And so it's, it's somewhat remarkable. So uh, Iran's violating the provisions. They, they are only supposed to have 300 kilograms of uh, low enriched uranium, and they're up at 2,408 kilograms right now. They're also uh, enriching to higher levels. They've gone from 3.67% to 4.5%. And what's significant about that is to go from 3.67 to 5 is, is difficult. And it is way, way more difficult than going from, say, 20 to 90. And 90 is where you have your weapons grade uranium. So they're, they're enriching at higher levels. This brings that breakout period down to six months. They've, uh, uh, they've installed a bunch more centrifuges. They're on research and development. They're introducing fissile material at Fordow, which what had been converted was supposed to be converted uh, to a stable isotope production facility is now being turned back into a nuclear weapons production plant. <laughs> so it's a pretty dangerous situation. The U.S. enormously damaged its negotiating credibility by backing out of this deal. The Iranians were in full compliance. So regardless of how you feel about the Iranians, this deal was doing its job. We had a window into their entire field cycle from mining to waste disposal. We knew everything they were doing. And we walked away from that. We violated it. So as, as I mentioned, these sanctions are not supported by our, our allies and partners. Then I'm... If, unless you have not turned on your television in the last week, you probably know that there was an assassination of a top uh, Iranian scientist. This man, Fakhrizadeh, was the mastermind of that nuclear weapon design testing I referred to that occurred between 2003 and 2009. So this is not going to really, you know, this is not really going to significantly affect their program unless they have a clandestine weapons program, but they've got plenty of scientists. But what this did um, is, is it's, it's created a, a huge, huge problem for the moderates in Iran. It could potentially make it extremely difficult for Biden 
when he comes into office to re-enter this deal because we need to see how the Iranians are going to react, right? And so I found out just a few hours ago that today in Iran, the Iranians passed legislation saying that they are now going to enrich up to 20% and that if uh, oil and trade sanctions aren't lifted in the next two months, they're going to kick out all the inspectors. So we're going to go blind to their program. This is a disastrous outcome, absolutely disastrous. So I had written this slide you're looking at now before I found that out. So that answers some of my questions. Uh, so will Iran with the Trump administration, they're gonna give Biden about four days to enter re-enter that deal. And that really restricts what Biden has said he would like to do, which is lengthen the uh, expiration of some of the provisions of the deal that were so controversy and perhaps see about expanding it. The Iranians are gonna give him time to do that. Um, so I mentioned the, the imprint from China and Russia, that, that will continue. Um, Iran has already stated that if the US wants to get back into the deal, they will demand compensation for lost trade revenues due to US sanctions. They feel entitled for uh, lost monies because the US sanctioned them and violated the deal. This would be a very, very tricky thing for Biden to pull off. I don't know how he could do it. And certainly not if he's only got four days. They could now break out to a nuclear weapon. Okay, we're gonna go blind to their program. We're not gonna see what they're doing. Um, there could be a mix, missile strike, like when they when Soleimani, General Soleimani was uh, assassinated. Understand that Soleimani and Fakhrizadeh were, are both IRGC, that's the Islamic Revolution uh, Republican Guard. When, when Soleimani was assassinated, the, the Iranians sent 100 ballistic missiles at US bases in Iraq. So that could be a very real possibility. Um, they could test a nuclear weapon. We know that they saved their, their research and their technology from uh, their, their, te their design testing back in the early 2000s. We don't know how far along they got with it, if, they, if they've got a, re a reliable design that they could produce a weapon. So there could be a test. They could withdraw from the uh, JCPOA entirely and expel the IAEA inspectors, which they just said they were going to do. And even worst case scenario, if they kick out the inspectors and 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 go towards a nuclear weapon, they'll withdraw from the non-proliferation treaty, which would be a, a, an international disaster. It could lead to a tenth nuclear weapon state, which we do not need. It is the worst case scenario. So that's my presentation. I'm ready for any questions. Hi. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... Let's use uh, everybody out there in the audience. Let's use uh, the Q and A feature within the within Zoom, which you can see uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have a couple of questions here. I'll just go right to them from Madeline Wright. Um, question: Pretty focused. Do you think there's a possibility of United States and NATO military action in Iran? I think up until January twentieth, there is. I think it would be a, an enormous mistake. Uh, the, any, any, any conflict initiated by the US is going to be uh, regarded as a regime change because that's what, you know, well, it, it will be looked at as an attempt at a regime change by the Iranians. And the Iranians response to that is already well known. They're gonna start throwing missiles at, at military installations throughout the Middle East, US military installations. They might even go after Israel. So, I don't think NATO will become involved in this, but you know, if, if, if Iran tests and we know they have a weapon, then that's a whole different calculus. So I have a, a, a related question, which is um, how, what was your reaction, if you can go back in time just a little bit to earlier this year in the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, how did you think that was gonna play out in, relation, in, in US Iranian relationships and how has that played out? Well, that, that's a good question. And my response is, at the time, I was kind of torn because I know that Soleimani was responsible for a lot of American uh, military deaths. But on the other hand, you know, I'm a political scientist. I don't want anybody assassinating top military generals uh, 
you know, and thinking that this is something, this is now a new norm and, and this is something we're going to do. The Iranian response was very measured. They, they fired a bunch of ballistic missiles at U.S. bases, but I want you to know they informed the Iraqis that they were going to do this. And the Iraqis have informed the Americans. And that is why all of the American uh, military personnel were underground when those things got hit and everybody got concussions, but nobody got killed. I believe that they have not concluded their response to the Suleimani killing. I believe it went underground. I think that they're going to take their ounce of blood and their pound of flesh out uh, clandestinely. Uh, another question here from Jorge Luis Reyes. Uh, is Russia, China, and Iran a new axis of power? <sighs> I, I, I wouldn't go that far. I would say that we've entered a new era of military sharing and cooperation. We know the Russians and the Chinese have conducted military drills together. Iran, like I said, they, they need military equipment. They need an air force. Both China and Russia are looking to, to you know, take advantage of that. Uh, it means hundreds of millions of dollars in arms sales. Um, but, you know, they have conflicting regional interests themselves. China is right on Russia's border. They, they, they're not necessarily allies. I'm not saying they're adversaries, but I don't see them working as uh, some sort of an axis, not in the near future. I think that they'll advance cooperation. There's a lot of money to be made, and 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 China really wants Iranian oil. Um, Joe, a question from our colleague Gary Grossman. Uh, very often, I'll just read it. Joe, very often when terrorist acts occur, Iran is blamed, at least by the U.S., Israelis, Saudis, etc. What evidence exists that they are indeed responsible for this terror worldwide? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? My, my, sure. um, my, very my. often when terrorist acts occur, Iran is blamed at least by the US, Israelis, Saudis, et cetera. What evidence exists that they, that is the Iranians, are indeed responsible for this terror worldwide? Well, it's mostly the financial trail, but I don't have access to classified information, so I'm not sure how Israel and the US are drawing their conclusions. I would say if we start looking at specific terror events, um, we know, for instance, that the Jewish center bombing in Argentina was done by the Iranians because we know which Iranians did it. But for me to expound on this topic without having access to classified information, I can, I, it would only, I can only surmise uh, based on open source evidence. And, um, and so that's my response. Um, a question here from Cameron Vega, a uh, student research fellow with our center. Um, if Iran successfully completes construction of a nuclear weapon, what is the risk of them proliferating such weapons to non-state and regional actors hostile to the United States and Israel? Well, my first response to that is there's just no way they would do that. That's a whole different ballgame. Like you, you, Iran becomes a nuclear weapon state. I, I don't see them allowing that technology to get in the wrong hands because if, if it's used, Iran will get, Iran's going to get hit with a nuclear weapon. It's the same thing with North Korea. Kim Jong-un can make a lot of money uh, proliferating his uh, nuclear technology, but he's not doing it because that, that's not in their long-term goals, right? They, they, these, these in, in North Korea's instance, this is to deter an invasion, right? So if, if, uh, um, if the U.S., mounts an invasion, the North Koreans are going to see it. They're going to see it at our bases in the region. They're going to nuke those bases. And they're going to dare the U.S. to nuke them back because now they have ICBMs that can hit anywhere in the United States. So we'll get hurt. I imagine the Iranians want, if they move towards a nuclear weapon program, it would be simply for deterrence and a second strike capability. What the Iranians need is they need a conventional military. They need, a, a, they need a, a, an open pipeline for them to move military technologies in and out of their programs and to modernize and to maintain them. So if they go for a nuclear weapon and they do any kind of testing right now, I would say it would be out of response to you know, what's going on with these assassinations um, and the provocations that have resulted uh, in, in these, these steps like throwing in the inspectors out. Uh, question here from Andy Gordon, a uh, lawyer who also teaches at the ASC Law School. Can you comment on Tom Friedman's column from last week regarding threats raised by Iranian drones and cruise missiles that need to be addressed first or at least simultaneously? So it's, it's a great question. And, and I think that these types of things do need to be addressed. I think that you address them outside 
of the sphere of the, the nuclear deal. You, you leave the nuclear deal alone. You keep our visuals into their program with the way they are so we know that they're not diverting. And then you go after a missile technology or drone technology agreement. There are international regimes in place. The missile technology control regime, uh, it has 35 member states, but most, member sta most states that have a ballistic missile program abides by the provisions within that, that regime. So creating a deal for missiles is, has already really been kind of written by the experts in the field. Most people understand what the Iranians would be willing to uh, agree to um, and what kind of uh, restrictions and limitations we could put on their program. But that would be a separate deal. And, uh, and that, to me, is the way to go. Uh, a question from Kyle Ballard. Given the nuclear capabilities of countries in the region, Israel, Pakistan, and India, why is it not acceptable for the country, that is to say Iran, to have the same access, especially if a reformist government gained power? Well, because the, 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 the international objective is total nuclear disarmament. The Non-Proliferation Treaty Article 6 says states will negotiate to disarm until they completely eliminate their stockpile. So the last thing we want to do is admit another state to the nuclear weapons club. Additionally, there is security issues and safety issues uh, centered around every nuclear weapons program. First of all, nuclear weapons programs don't get inspected by the IAEA. And secondly, there's always the possibility of sabotage or diversion or theft or a mistake, mis miscalculation that leads to a launch that wasn't intended. There's all kinds of things related to a nuclear weapons program um, that are dangerous and unpredictable that aren't related to somebody deciding to press the button and launch a first strike. So we want to keep them out of the nuclear club. We want to continue with our uh, disarmament agreements with Russia until our stockpiles get to a level that is acceptable to the other nuclear weapon states to join in to, uh, for um, disarmament agreements on their own. A question here from Madeline Wright. How is this deal, that is to say the JCPOA, different to the nuclear program deal with Libya back in 2003? So that wasn't really a deal. That was the, what Muhammad, uh, Muammar, uh, Muammar Gaddafi did was he voluntarily surrendered his nuclear program. We found out later that he didn't surrender all of it, but that, that was a way for him to get sanctions relief from the international community and re-enter uh, the international community as a responsible actor. So th this, there's, there's a big difference between just giving up all of your centrifuges and having the IAEA inspect act, you know, facilities that are, that are functioning um, and, and enriching. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing program as opposed to just giving up your program. There's, it's, it's a big difference. So let me, let me just add to that. Let me just add to that. Iran is party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, member states are allowed a peaceful uses program. The big bone of contention here is whether the Iranians should be allowed to enrich because they had kept enrichment facilities hidden from the IAEA. So the, the Iranians have a right as, a, as a, a conforming member of this treaty to have a peaceful uses program. Um, given your, your knowledge and expertise in this field and the, and the heightened tensions surrounding Iran right now, um, if you were given the opportunity to provide uh, President-elect Biden and the national security team with advice how to begin the new administration as regards Iran, the nuclear threat, the JCPOA, what sort of measures and, and suggestions would you make? Well, I would say adhere to the deal, um, find a way to communicate with the Iranians in a way that they find acceptable so that they would uh, uh, not kick out the inspectors. I think that's the number one priority is to keep this verification regime active. I think that what I would recommend to this administration is to look at the success of uh, this whole entire process. The P5 plus one plus the EU and Iran all sat around a table and agreed on a, an extremely intrusive regime that was very, very technical. All of these, these, these actors have their, have their own agenda of what they'd like to see these outcomes be. 
for them to sit down at a table and through statecraft and diplomacy, negotiate an agreement that covered all of this ground and that the Iranians actually agreed to was remarkable. So I would say, let's continue this. You know, we were in a stalemate with Iran for years. They were sanctioned. We didn't have the inspections that we wanted to make sure that they weren't diverting any of the materials and not technology. Now we know what they're doing. And that was a remarkable achievement. I would focus on that and build on that and maybe use that process as a model to start going after a ballistic missile program and to start addressing state sponsors of terror, terrorism programs and, and the other uh, you know, behavior of the Iranians that we find so objectionable. So if the JCPOA was such a remarkable achievement, and that can be demonstrated with, you know, with various facts, and, and we even have um, the US administration, including under the Trump administration, to, be, to verify compliance uh, with the JCPOA. So given that situation, what explains the, enor the, the powerful rejection of this agreement um, by many players within US politics and you know what? What justifies those claims, and what gives it you know so much support um, among so many influential players in the United States? Well, it's it's really the players. You got uh, uh, the uh, John Bolton when he was hired as a national security advisor. I just shook my head. He John Bolton was one of the people that was pushing this this president to violate this agreement. Let's just focus on him for a second. So these people's uh, agendas, individual agendas, mean something in a presidency, especially, you know, a president who it, it seems determined to uh, advance the agenda of hawks, um, which is what we've seen for the last few years. So let me explain something to you about John Bolton. John Bolton is a treaty killer. Back in uh, the uh, Clinton administration, we negotiated something with the um, uh, North Koreans called the Agreed Framework. This uh, put in place a inspection regime that prevented them from gaining a nuclear weapon for 10 years. When Bolton was uh, um, placed in the subsequent Bush administration, he made it clear that he was going after that agreement and he did. And when that agreement was violated, the North Koreans threw the inspectors out of their country and now they have nuclear weapons that can reach the United States. So. I, I would say that there's individual agendas and that there's this, this use now of misinformation to fire up a base that's gonna vote for you based on things that are just not factual. So I think it's the individuals and then this political, uh, uh, I don't wanna say a movement, but this ability to, to have widespread misin misinformation not debunked and use it as a political weapon to, to, to gain votes. That, that's what I think about that. Do you see any failure or flaw within the JCPOA that it was not managed as a formal treaty, that is to say, ratified by the U.S. Senate? Well, in a perfect world, this would have been a treaty that got ratified by the U.S. Senate, but the U.S. Senate has a very long history of not ratifying treaties. So I understand why the Obama administration went about it the way it did. We couldn't see this hawkish government coming to place that was not acting rationally. Starting a war with Iran in the Middle East right now would be a disaster for everybody involved. Lots and lots of people would die. And this seems to be the, the area that's being pushed. This assassination of this, this civilian scientist is, is a case in point. You know, if the Iranians decide to react at a way that, that I don't think they will, you know, disproportionately, this could lead to a regional conflict. So why, why is this type of action being allowed or not roundly criticized, I don't know. Um. So, so to turn to a, another area of, of, um, of you know, non-proliferation questions, you know, when the Trump administration um, first came into power, they had been, it was indicated by the previous president, Obama, that one of the most pressing national security concerns was North Korea. And uh, one of the earliest and most focused efforts to engage in in the foreign policy sphere by President Trump was to come up with an, a new agenda, a new mechanism, a new set of uh, um, strategies to deal with North Korean nuclear program, uh, including face-to-face -face meetings between the, the leader of North Korea and, and the leader of the United States. Um, what's your assessment now four years into that effort? Uh, what came of it? What were the gains? What were the losses? How would you look at that in terms of non-proliferation and foreign policy? 
Well, I mean, we, we didn't get anything out of that, did we? Uh, uh, Kim Jong-un got some legitimacy and he got a, you know, a, a nice spotlight on the international stage, but he didn't, he didn't alter what they're doing with their nuclear program slightly. It didn't slow down, it sped up. So they developed uh, bigger and, and more powerful ballistic missiles. They tested uh, the most powerful nuclear weapon yet. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't see what we achieved by any of this. This. This Hollywood diplomacy that we saw that was all looked like the only thing that came out of it was a bunch of, you know, picture opportunities. So I think that it's a failed policy, and that the. I, I don't necessarily say believe that this. This uh, you know wait and see policy that had been going on for years before that is is the right way to go. But it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle when somebody gets a nuclear weapon. And the North Korean strategy is sound. They can hit Guam, they can hit Okinawa, they can hit Washington D.C. So nobody's going to try to go take out Kim Jong Un right now. Um, so I would say that it's been a policy uh, victory for the North Koreans and an absolute failure on the United part of the United States. Globally, do you see any major takeaways from what is now decades of efforts uh, at, at nuclear nonproliferation that we can use as sort of guideposts for moving forward to minimize the, you know, the, the proliferation of nuclear weapons? Yeah, I think that uh, an organization called ICANN uh, was instrumental in, in helping uh, the uh, United Nations write and, and implement a resolution that became the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of, of Nuclear Weapons. Um, I, I, I think I have the acronym wrong, but we now, nuclear weapons are now banned. Enough states have ratified this treaty uh, that has become international law. It doesn't mean that the P5 is, gonna, is going to um, comply with this, but what started off as a small organization putting out this idea that was kind of laughed at by the nuclear weapon states became a treaty that's being ratified all over the world. And I think that should be looked at as a success and find a way to support and encourage this type of thing uh, as, as another method to hold the nuclear weapon states feet over the fire to get them to negotiate new disarmament agreements until we can get these stockpiles eradicated. Do you think that there is any likelihood or even possibility that nuclear stockpiles will be eradicated? Not in my lifetime, but I think that it's, it's one of the most important endeavors in the world today. We have the ability to decimate life on this planet many times over. And since, since we attacked Japan with nuclear weapons in World War II, there have been around 1,000 near misses. I see it much more likely that somebody makes a mistake reading early warning radar and launching a counterattack than I do a president or an, a rational leader actually launching a first strike. So there's plenty of terrorist organizations out there that would like to um, get their hands on fissile, fissile material and make dirty bombs. So there's it, just so many ways that this could turn bad and ugly that it need, you know, some, some of the most brilliant people I know are on this, are in this field and working every day to try to get the nuclear weapon states to live up to their obligations under Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and that is negotiate disarmament. We are getting there. New START was excellent. New START's about to expire. It will be extended with a signature. If Trump doesn't do it, then Biden will, and then we can start negotiating the follow-on treaty where we can reduce the stockpiles even further. So this work needs to continue. Um, I think we're at a scary point in history right now and that we can't take our foot off the gas. We have to stay focused and we have to make sure that the powers that be in the nuclear weapon states understand that the people who are pressuring them to negotiate these disarmament agreements are not gonna back off, we're not gonna go away. So we're, we've come to the, the sort of the close of this evening's event, but before we uh, thank everybody and say goodbye, do you have any final words, any sort of parting thoughts about you know, JCPOA, Iran, situation of, uh, that, w that we're facing at present and you know just how we should orient our thoughts and expectations moving forward? Well, I just want to say that I, th I think that I, there's a lot of Iranian behavior that I disagree with. I, I believe that you know that th that needs to be addressed. but I also think that there was a time before the Iranian Revolution when US and Israel were partners with Iran and the people and their society is rich in culture and education. 
They have brilliant scientists. They have an excellent university system. Um, these are the, the Iranian people are, are worth our efforts to continue trying to find ways to talk and come to solutions to our disagreements. And that's what, how we should do these things moving forward. We have got a, an Iranian government that is very contentious. They have their beliefs on why they are that way and they're not gonna back off. But the JCPOA indicates that we, if we talk, then we can get things done. And I think that, that that's what we should do moving forward. So what a nice place to end our, our evening and to end our fall speaker series with the idea that through dialogue, by talking, we may well be able to achieve some positive results for our world. Um, thanks to everybody who's joined us this evening. Uh, special thanks to Jabraza for being our speaker this evening. Um, also, um, thanks to Selena Daniel, who is our center coordinator, who's, who's been behind the scenes organizing all of this and sending out the various notices that you, that you received to, to hear about this event. Uh, we wish you all uh, wonderful holidays, wonderful end of the semester for those of you at the university. And thank you all so much. Uh, have a great rest of your evening.